Welcome to Hot Flashbacks, where we boldly navigate the ups and downs and unexpected detours of our 30s and 40s, while finally recalling how clueless we were in our 20s. I'm Molly Ward, your captain through this midlife roller coaster. Stick around for laughs, life lessons, and maybe a few I can't believe I survived that stories. Follow our journey on Instagram and Facebook at Hot Flashbacks. Make sure to like, follow, and share so I can keep making these episodes. Let's dive in. Yeah. When am I going to become more wise? I feel like... Right? Based on some... I know. Based mm. on some of these other things, I feel like that should be happening pretty soon, but... I don't... Well, I'll let, I'll let you know if it's Okay. Sexy. If you notice, if you talk to me and you ever walk away and think, wow, that was very wise of her. Tell me. Oh, tell me. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the kind of thing I want someone to say about me. Oh, that Molly... What a wise woman. It's, it's like... Welcome back to Hot Flashbacks. I'm your host, Molly Ward. Excited to be here today, as I always am excited to be here. And, you know, a friend of mine said, I said, when do I stop doing this podcast? And she said, when you stop enjoying it. So I'm still enjoying it. I'm still having fun. And I am really looking forward to chatting with my friend Jessica today. Jessica is Hi. hey welcome welcome to the show uh does I know it's weird like it doesn't feel like a show because it's just you talking to me but it, it we're calling it a show uh that's what the people say so Jessica do you want to give us your little spiel tell us who you are how long you've known each other oh and how old you are that's that's a key a key component if you're comfortable Oof. you know <laughs> if you remember <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna start right off the bat just, just the hard stuff ourselves in our age yeah Right. So hi, thank you for having me. My name is Jessica. I am 52 years old. And Molly and I know each other because we work together. Um, and we, we've been working together for, what is it, eight years? Going on nine years now at this nine, point? Nine years in November. Right. So Wild. It's, it's crazy how time flies. So we get to see each other most days so we spent lots of hours together in nine years we have yeah and where are you from where do you live what's your backstory not the trauma don't tell us about the trauma yet we don't want to know about childhood trauma or any of that not yet uh, okay oh okay okay i'll skip past okay. that part then. i was born and raised in south africa to british parents and uh we immigrated to the united states in 1991 so I've actually been in the United States longer than I was in South Africa. But South Africa is is home to me still, yeah. even now. And it certainly influenced a lot of who I am and who I became as an adult. But now I live in Bountiful with my husband. I have a 26-year-old daughter and um, just trying to live my best life as as much as you can with the uniforms. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. That's true. Um, yeah, it's a it's it's a glorious That's time. That's the caveat. So, Bountiful, Utah, which is a little bit just a little bit north of Salt Lake, right? You yeah. mentioned how South Africa is like home, even though you haven't been there in a long time, or well, you have, but you haven't lived there for quite a while. And I always feel like that, you know, home is not necessarily where you were born or where you, you know, went to elementary school. Uh, because I always say that about New Orleans. And I think it feels like home to me. It's also where I feel like I did a lot of my developing just because it was my early 20s to my early 30s and I think of that sort of as like a core development time of like becoming an adult so I had like a lot of you know big first adult experiences in New Orleans so it just feels like I feel more connected there than I think I and and living there for almost nine years that was at that point the longest I'd ever lived anywhere so I think that was another piece of it and sort of having it feel like home yeah sure sure I I can relate to that I think I select South Africa as, as the place that feels like home because that is where I had the most experiences that influenced who I was going to become. Even though I didn't realize that that was the case then, I can look back now and see how my upbringing there really impacted who I am. So I'm always going to have a soft spot in my heart for South Africa, even if I don't get to go back there and, yeah. and live there. 
Would you? If I was really wealthy, I would love to retire in Cape Town. That would be a real yeah. dream for me. But I mean, you know what I do and you know what I'm the wealth so thing working out. Yeah. I'm not sure that that's in the cards. <laughs> You know, I'm going to have to yeah, settle. I, I just remember dreaming about being rich as a kid. Like, I just thought that I would be rich someday. And I think it's in about your early 20s or mid 20s when you realize that's probably not going to happen for you. You know, like, I think a lot of people mm -hmm. grow, a lot of kids grow up thinking like they're going to be millionaires in one form or fashion. Didn't happen for me either. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think as a kid, you sort of, you grow up wrestling off all of the, the careers or the things that you want to be when you grow up. And I had somewhat moderate goals. I really wanted to be a secretary Ooh. when I grew up, but my brother <laughs> wanted to be a fireman and a king <laughs> and, you know, a rock star and all of these things. And so you just sort of assumed as a kid that all of that yeah. was possible. And then you you grow up and you realize that being a rock star is something that happens for at less than 0.01% of yeah. the population. And that's not really in the cards for everybody. So life has, has a way of upending all of your childhood But you had some, some real you know. humble um, expectations of yourself. So that's good. You've really excelled. I thank you. I exceeded <laughs> my childhood expectations <laughs> of myself. I love the idea of being really organized. Oh. And, you know, having a very organized Files. desk and a roller deck. You yeah. remember those and I, just, yeah, being super helpful <laughs> and organized. A calculator um, that like when you type so, into it, it yeah. like prints the stuff out, like the little, yeah. Uh, sure. Label what? makers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This isn't the first time I've discussed label makers yes. on the show. So <laughs> sadly, <laughs> I appreciate your enthusiasm. Uh, so perimenopause. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just let's back up for a second, because I want to say that I quite honestly at 43 did not know that there was a stage before the stage. So I had heard of menopause. Mm -hmm. And Menopause the Musical, which I haven't seen. And I feel like I need to probably see. Um, but I didn't know that there was like a like a shit storm before the shit storm that you had to go through. As if the as if the menopause shit storm wasn't enough, you had to have sort of a, a warm up, if you will. And I didn't know that till like a year or two years ago. So my mind was blown. Now it's all I think about. Because I'm, I texted my mom the other day and asked her, hey, when did you start menopause? And, you know, she told me that you're, you know, the average is like 30 years after you got your first period. And I was like, huh, okay. Um, so anyway, I didn't know much about perimenopause. I still don't feel like I'm as informed as I need to be. But I do feel like I learned a lot about, um, you know, growing up and puberty and adolescence and all that when I was a child. And I still feel like I know a lot about it and very well informed about how all that works. But nobody really tells you about the other side, the the reverse, the reverse adolescence, right? Um, so I'm excited to dig into this. And I'm also slightly terrified uh, to, to find out more about what my life is going to be like. But so you are you are 53 <laughs> and you feel like you're in full blown. Oh, sorry. Two. Sorry. Excuse me, ma'am. We're going to come on the show Do again. Do not prematurely age me. You are 52. <laughs> I'm 52 okay. and a half. I have been corrected. <laughs> um, and you are you are where in your menopausal journey? So I'm, I'm definitely still okay. very menopausal. I actually had a great discussion with a doctor just a few weeks ago about this. And you were speaking earlier about not even really knowing about perimenopause, not knowing much about menopause un until somewhat recently. And what the doctor had to say was actually quite shocking to me, was that there, there just isn't enough uh, research and learning that goes on even for doctors on this topic. And perimenopause even less so. And so while we're beginning to see more conversation about this topic and women finally feeling more free to speak on it, there's still a lot that we don't know about it. There's still a lot that hasn't been researched or written about it. 
And so I think we're sort of all learning together, which I, I don't know if that's comforting or not, right? That that our ignorance is not because we're choosing to be blissfully, blissfully ignorant, but rather that there just isn't enough known about it in the medical world either. So I started to sort of read up a little bit about it a few years ago when I started to notice changes in my ability to stay asleep all night. Um, joint pain was something that I started to notice where randomly my elbow would hurt for no reason because I didn't injure it. Um, I, I, there was no noticeable change in, in any other area, but just, I would struggle with my elbow hurting for three months and then it would just go away without any treatment, without me doing anything special. And it, it just felt so random and disconnected that I didn't even attribute it to perimenopause until I learned more about it and started to put pieces yeah. together. And so it helps you to feel a little less crazy too, because you sort of assume that your body's just falling apart everywhere, but for separate right. reasons. And then when you start to learn that, okay, the, the waking up at 3 a.m. every morning, the, you know, night sweats or the body aches or the joint pain, all of that is connected to, to perimenopause. Frozen shoulder is connected to perimenopause. What, what is a frozen uh, shoulder? It, it's not the only cause of. So my sister actually had this. Um, it, it, your shoulder joint locks up so that you have a, a loss of mobility and your range of motion becomes so that you can't lift your arm up past your Oh, that your sounds shoulder. fun. Um, and yeah, what a delight. Yeah, yeah it's all, it's, <laughs> it's all fun. Mom. It's all fun. So in some respect, it helps to sort of know that all of these things are connected and that your body isn't falling apart piece yeah. by piece. But on the other hand, I, I feel like there is not enough grace given to women for the things that we go through if we're not going through puberty and painful periods and all of the things associated with childbirth and the way that pregnancy changes your body and all of that sort of thing then pretty soon after your childbearing years you go straight into perimenopause and that can last as i understand it 10, 10 years. years yeah and and <laughs> and then you end up with menopause which sounds even less pleasant um and and i'm i'm not quite sure what comes death. after that um just all oh, just age. death i think is next uh, <laughs> turning into <laughs> yeah death. exactly um, i feel like i need frozen not frozen shoulder i need like frozen like fingers so or something you know frozen like like uh, thumb joints and finger joints so i don't so i just like stop shoveling food in my mouth or something like something that would be like <laughs> beneficial <laughs> to me yeah helpful. yeah like frozen uh, fingers after 7 p.m so i stop eating chocolate at nine o'clock at night that's that's the kind of perimenopause symptom i need that i do not have i have the 3 a.m wake up thing though yeah that's mm -hmm. that's kind of what what got me uh started was i've always been a good sleeper and i've always i mean some people just don't sleep well and i've always slept well and so i started not sleeping well for about six months and that kind of led me down a, a rabbit hole at you know three in the morning while i'm googling my symptoms uh oh speaking of okay i know like I'll digress on this story about this what i'm what i'm thinking is a perimenopausal incident perimenopausal incident we're gonna call it a pmi okay so mm -hmm. i had a pmi and it was like the most unnerving experience so i went to bed per usual normal and then i'm laying there and i can't i i just things itch but it's more like i feel like something's crawling on me that's a different feeling. It's not like a, my mosquito bite itches. It's like a, there's something. Do you know how sometimes like you'll have like a hair that's like stuck to your arm from your head or stuck to your shirt and you can like feel it touching you, but you can't find it and it's just driving you nuts. And yeah, of so I felt like that, but like all yes. over my body. And so I went to bed at 11 and finally at one o'clock in the morning, I, I had to get up because I 
I couldn't stop feeling like there were bugs on me. And it wasn't the first time this had happened because I remembered uh, some weeks prior when I was in Alabama, I said to Alex, I wonder if feeling like bugs are crawling on you is like a side effect of um, SSRI. So like taking like Zoloft or something, right? So I take Zoloft. Mm -hmm. And so, because I had, I had experienced it before, but not ever to this extent, just for like, minutes of a day and so i'm laying in bed and i feel like i have bugs on me to the point where i'm starting to like feel a little bit crazy like i keep telling myself there's nothing on you there's nothing on you but it doesn't change the fact that i can feel it and so i fly out of my bed at about one o'clock in the morning and i you know kind of like brush over my face and kind of claw at it and i tell and alex is like what what what's happening and i'm like there's a bug on my face and I look at the pillow and I see this giant beetle and I'm like, there's a, there's a beetle right there on the pillow. She's like, no, there's not. And I'm like, I swear that there was like, I blinked. It was like one of those, when you wake up from a dream and you think you see something for like a few seconds and then realize there's nothing there. It was that it was like, I hallucinated this bug. So I felt like a psycho. So I can't sleep. I finally, I get up and I kind of, go in a different room so I don't disturb Alex all night. And finally at like 3 a.m., I'm Googling all of these symptoms. And this this has a name. The name is not catchy or attractive. It's called formication. Okay. Not fornication, but formication (laughs) with an M. And it is actually experienced by women who are in perimenopause. And it is also mm-hmm. commonly ex- experienced by people who are withdrawing from amphetamines, which I'm not doing. So I have to figure <laughs> it's the perimenopause thing. And I got to tell you, I barely got any sleep. I felt crazy. My whole body felt weird. And then I had like PMI PTSD because I had like PTSD from the incident where like the next night I'm laying in bed going, I hope I don't itch. I hope I don't itch. I hope there's not a bug on me for like three nights. And it hasn't happened since. Mm -hmm. Praise be to Jesus. But it was awful. And if that happens to me every night, I'm going to have to like get some medication or something. Because that's insane. That's actually quite hard. It was. That's a hard. It was bananas. I'm telling you. I, I don't know what I don't know what else to say. It was I. It was one of those moments where I thought like, is this the next 10 years of my life? (laughs) Like, am I going to have to deal with this for the next 10 years? And then I spiraled into this whole thing about how people become addicted to painkillers and sleeping pills because of things like this that they don't treat. So, cause someone said, we will just take a Benadryl, you know, tomorrow night. And I was like, yeah, fine. And I was like, yeah, but I can't, if that continues, I can't just take Benadryl every night. It's really not good for you to take Benadryl every night. And so, yeah, anyway, Mm -hmm. then I spiraled about how I'm going to become some sort of addict because of this formication, but it only happened the one time. And just so you know, fornication, I had to look up because I thought I knew what it meant. Do you know what it means? Well, isn't it essentially premarital sex? Isn't that what fornication is? See, so I... Or am I misunderstanding that? No, you're you're right. You're... You're right. But I thought that it was just like sex in general, but it's not. It's specifically in oh. a course between people who are not married. Mm-hmm. I, okay. Well, I'm, I, now I feel stupid and I didn't know that. Yeah. So now I know. It's okay that okay. you don't know I, that. It's, it's seriously I not feel that better. important to these kind of things. <laughs> I feel like it's a word that was created to shame people. Yeah. I think of it as like a very biblical so. word. So it's not like a word that I use in my daily anyway um so i hope i never have i hope i never formicate again um (laughs) and (laughs) but i think that what you what you're talking about is the other piece of perimenopause and menopause that we often don't connect to those conditions and that's brain fog and all of the the mental stuff that comes with it right? That we have no control over. So am I forgetful because I have early onsets Alzheimer's or is it just perimenopause? Yeah. Am I, you know, putting my keys in the fridge because I'm losing my mind or is it because of perimenopause? Am I 
you know, spiraling on something that has happened that day because I'm on the edge of sanity and I need to go and see a therapist or is it just perimenopause? It's torturous. The, the mental side of it feels more significant to me than the physical side of it because the physical side, you sort of expect to see those things start to occur as you get older, right? You're going to experience joint pain. Of course you are. You're going to see some arthritis. Um, of course you are. That's just part yeah. of aging. You're going to have more trouble sleeping as you age. I think that's sort of commonly understood, but it's, it's the mental symptoms that I am more fearful of in a lot of ways. Yeah. Anything else I feel like can be managed except for the beetle thing. The beetle thing, I don't know how to manage that exactly. But if you find out, let me know. So if it, it did say to one me, that you could take Benadryl, um, actually, be, it would help with the feeling that you are itchy. Um, and then the other thing it said was, uh, what was the other thing it said? Oh, that it, it can lead to hallucinations. Like, and that's, again, that's what happens when people who are coming off of amphetamines are like, you know, scratching their skin and picking and itching and they mm -hmm. think that there are things on them. And sometimes they hallucinate that there are that that is exactly what happened to me. And I don't even do amphetamines. So I feel like that's a real disappointment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, decided. To did, you, did you know about perimenopause? So how long, how long would you say that you kind of have recognized that you've been in it? Like, when did you sort of start to notice? So you're 54 and <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're 52. Okay. When did you start to notice? <laughs> Probably about four years ago. I mean, fortunately I've had a really great relationship with my family mm -hmm. physician. And this is something that I actually started talking to her about probably five, six, okay. seven years ago, you know, as, as I'm going for annual checkups and figuring out birth control and all of that sort of thing, um, you know, the, the discussions began. And so it's something that I knew a little bit about and at least started the discussions with my doctor ahead of time so that I had a little bit of an idea as to what to expect. But certainly, um, I didn't necessarily put together all of the things that were happening to me and, and understand that it was, right. Of course. right. I think I was, I was looking at things separately and treating things separately. Now I, I've gotten wiser and I will have discussions with my doctor that go a little bit like this. I have a UTI and they're happening more frequently. Is that connected to perimenopause? And you know what it is? It is. What? <sighs> Had you no, heard that before? Because when I Google it, like everything is connected to perimenopause like i feel like i'm <laughs> I, if you look at it it's like oh well it could just be perimenopause pretty much anything like oh well you know um, i'm having a lot of gas and bloating lately oh look i have perimenopause i don't know i mean there's a zillion symptoms right who's right. to know um it who is to know but it's i think the important thing is to have more open discussions with your doctors when you are meeting with them so that you are checking in to see what could be related and what is not related so that you have a better understanding, right? Because I never would have asked that question five years yeah. ago. I just would have assumed that it was a UTI all by itself and, and I needed to treat it all by itself. But that's wild. Yeah, things, yeah. things are different. I mean, you so older. in your younger years, did you do you feel like you paid like significant attention to your body, or do you feel like you're more in tune now with things as they as they change or are different? Um, because I remember, like, you know, I would get up in the morning in my twenties and be like. 
Oh, look, a bruise. Oh, yeah, that's because, you know, last night was wild and I stumbled into my apartment and tripped over my rug and now I have a bruise on my knee. And now I wake up and I'm like, oh, look, a bruise. No idea. No idea where that came from, how I got it. I don't recall. I don't know if that's brain fog or if I just don't pay enough attention to what I'm doing. But I do feel like I've become a little more in tune with my body and that I'm like waiting to see certain things happen. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think that for me, I probably became so much more aware of my body and things connected to it when I got pregnant with Maya, because there are so many drastic ways that your body changes in order to accommodate a pregnancy and then a birth and then feeding that baby. And it is, I know a lot of women don't talk about sort of all the changes that occur to your body, but it's, it feels violent. And so many people do not prepare you for what you're about to experience or what happens to you during that time. And that was, that was a time in my life where I went, Oh, okay. Um, I'm not as in control of my body as I thought that I was, and I need to become a lot more attuned to it. And, and so that's where things really began to, to change for me. I would definitely agree that as I get older, I'm definitely more in touch with my body and understanding of what my body does or doesn't do, um, what its capabilities are, et cetera. Um, but I, I don't know that it just started somewhat recently. I really do think that that, that occurred a little bit earlier on for me. I think that I'm just more adept at talking yeah, about yeah. it now than I was when I was, you know, I had Maya when I was 26. And so I, I suffered through all of the things that, that changed, uh, but I didn't talk about them with anybody. I just dealt with it, right? And it was only after a long time of sort of talking to friends and, and other moms who had gone through similar things that I, that I felt less alone in all of those changes. Now I'm just a lot more willing to bring up the things that we didn't talk about back then to ask the questions that I didn't feel comfortable asking back then. And I think that that's part of the, the benefit of growing older is that you become more wise. You become better at advocating for yourself. You become better at asking the questions and bringing up the hard topics. And frankly, you give yeah. less fuck. When am I going to become more wise? I feel like right? based on some, mm. I know, based on some of these other things, I feel like that should be happening pretty soon, but... I don't. Well, I'll let I'll let you know if it sets. In. Okay. If you and notice, I'll... if you talk to me, and you ever walk away and think, "Wow, that was very wise of her," tell me, a, tell me. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the kind of thing I want someone to say about me. Oh, that Molly! What a wise woman! It's, it's like it's, the strangest compliment. It sounds it does glorious. It. I feel like I should be on Game of Thrones. I, I love it. Like, no, it just wise is such a wise is a word that you relate to age. I feel like, right? I mean, as a hundred percent, but in a positive way. Okay, yeah, like a I want like an to intelligence you earn I for do. time you've put in. Okay, mm -hmm. exactly. That comes from hard experiences. You know, fighting yeah. those fires, getting through dark times, <laughs> living it, getting in through person, dark times. Like, <laughs> first hand. I just think about like, yep, yeah, getting through dark times. Like you, because you didn't have electricity when you were born. Is that just can just candles? Okay, Molly. <laughs> All right, <laughs> now. Like, I don't know <laughs> when <laughs> this became about insulting me and my. You're not that body. I mind. know. Well, you are actually. You no, are I'm not. Mind, I'm not. And you know, they say uh, 45 to 55 is when for mm -hmm. average for the average for American women uh, specifically, but actually the world mm -hmm. average is 45 to 55. Um, and so I'm not like I'm not too. I mean, in theory, I could be only two years out. And they do say that women who have not 
um, given birth to children actually go through menopause earlier because they think what happens is like my really? eggs and my uterus are kind of like, oh, my God, no one's using us. Nothing interesting's happened down here. <laughs> Let's get this over with and get out of here or whatever it is that your ovaries do when you I, you know what? I should probably look this up. I don't even know what happens to your ovaries. They go somewhere or they just they hang out. You still have them, right? They don't just like. I, See, you don't know either. They, oh, you okay, still okay. have them. No, you still okay. have them. I, I mean, unless you have your ovaries removed. As part oh, yeah. Of no, I didn't have that. My understanding that that your ovaries exist in your body oh, until okay. you die. Um, the only thing that changes is that your body just doesn't produce Oh, yeah. So my body is probably like, dang, we've been putting these things out for years and this bitch hasn't done anything with them. So we are going to mm-hmm. call it quits a little sooner. Okay. Yeah, there's another reason that maybe I am glad I didn't have children. I don't know. I feel like the faster I go through menopause. Okay, my dream is that I want to get done with all of the crappy hard stuff in life so that when I retire, I don't I don't have to do that. Like I don't want to go through menopause when I'm 65 and trying to retire. Like I want to I want to be done with that. And so the sooner the better from from my standpoint right now the sooner the better bring it i'm let's do it i'm yeah. ready i'm ready to not have my period anymore enough. i feel like that is what happens sure. though right please tell me that that's actually what happens you don't have to have your period anymore that is okay, my good. understanding oh, with menopause thank God. yeah it, it's yeah it is i just google this stuff and i mean stuff. there's just there's a lot out there you know so <laughs> um so symptoms of perimenopause yeah. that i know about the 3 a.m wake up is one of them irregular irregular menstruation in one form or another either heavier lighter than normal earlier later than normal longer or shorter than normal etc um the achy joints is the one thing that i've read they don't really know why like they don't like like you were saying they don't have a good understanding necessarily and i wonder if that's at all tied to the fact that i mean you know we live a lot longer so our bodies are go go through these stages. So when the average age of death for women was like 50, like maybe they just never went through menopause. And so they don't know what it is. They didn't know what it was until like people started living long enough to I, I got to look this up. OK, you tell me your thoughts about that. Do you think it's possible that, that like scientifically a- we don't have a lot of data because one, um, we care less about women, generally speaking, and two, um, it just hasn't been like going on long enough. No, that's a very interesting thought. And I tend to agree with you. Although I would say that probably the predominant reason why we don't know enough about this is because we live in a male dominated world where women are not studied enough, where uh, the effects of various drugs or procedures on women are not studied. Everything is tested on men. Everything is is sort of presumed to to work for men, and is and is created by men. Um, That's why, like, so you see these like um, low T commercials because when when men go through menopause they don't they don't have there is no equivalent for a male but the equivalent is basically that their testosterone levels start to drop and so you'll see a lot of commercials Mm. form targeted at men about having low t um that's not gossip it's testosterone yeah sure yeah no i believe it but i I think your point about you know i mean certainly we we live in a privileged time you know a hundred years ago a woman were dying in childbirth. Yeah, absolutely. That wasn't so uncommon. So it says that the and average so, age, the average life expectancy a um, hundred years ago, so in 1900, was for women was 48. And for, for women of color was 33. So 120 years ago, um, people weren't, women weren't living long enough to go through menopause. But... I think it's said in in like 1923, so 100 years ago, um, the average life expectancy for a woman in the U.S. was 54. So again, still not. So if you think about the fact that people didn't start going through menopause until like 75 years ago or so, then, 
you know, probably nobody paid enough attention to study it. I would be <laughs> sure. I would be interested to know too what the childbearing age range was a hundred years ago, one hundred and fifty years ago versus now. I, if I was guessing, and this is based on zero knowledge on the topic, but I would imagine that women gave birth a lot older, you know, for a lot longer. Yeah. Had multiple children, multiple pregnancies. Whereas now I think that age range may have shrunk. I don't know. Yeah. Just, uh, just a guess on my part, but I'm curious. Um, it says that, Hmm. Well, and as you know, I mean, the, the number of women who died during childbirth, uh, w- was quite high. Uh, mm-hmm. so yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's just interesting too, that when you think about evolution, and the changes of our bodies, how I was talking to a friend actually just this past weekend. And she said uh, that her daughter had her period. And I was like, what, how old is she? She's like 11. And I was like, 11. She was like, yeah, um, she's actually the last of her friends. And I'm like, what 11 it's wild it is wild to me to think that you know that you could get pregnant at 11 years old um and that from an evolution standpoint i wonder when if ever that that age backs up a bit where where people begin to get their periods later um because people aren't getting Mm -hmm. pregnant that young hopefully anymore but i was like 11 it's wild the things you don't even understand at 11 sure yeah it is it's it's scary i've i've heard although i don't know how true this is and i'm sure that you can put lots of disclaimers after this podcast and all the things that i say that are historically (laughs) inaccurate or scientifically inaccurate but i i have read that the amount of hormones that we put into our food sources has contributed to our children maturing much faster than they used to it certainly makes sense i don't know how true it is but um, it is it is fascinating because it was certainly sort of 13, 14, 15 when right. I was growing up. And now it seems to be much younger, certainly elementary school easily. Yeah. Which is tough to think about because I would not want to be a girl and have a period that starts at 10 yeah. or 11 and know that that's going to be with me. Until I'm in my 50s. Yeah, and it is crazy because think about it. Like, it's actually girls are getting their period younger now than ever, while also people are waiting longer now than ever to get pregnant. So, right. So if you sure. think about it, it's like it almost like from an evolution standpoint of our it does. It almost doesn't make sense uh, that it would that that flop would happen without some sort of interference of another sort like you're saying maybe people talking about hormones like hormones in meat and hormones in beef and and some of those kinds of things Mm -hmm. that can could influence it so i don't know i don't know all i know is that i thought that puberty was bad when i was in it i kind of thought like this is terrible and stressful um but i also didn't know a lot and didn't have i had enough going on in my life that i felt like i i was busy and didn't really i concerned myself too much with what was happening with my body and my hormones and i wasn't really in tune with them i didn't realize that i was being like a total jerk to my parents you know that i was just but now that i'm older and i'm going through like the reverse of it it's i don't have the crankiness yet but i hope that i'm in a place now where i can see myself uh, from the outside looking in a little bit better because i have teenagers and i don't think they recognize how rude they're being or how crazy they can be or how unpredictable they are because of their hormones. And I don't think they see it even when we point it out to them. I hope that if those things happen to me when I go through menopause, that I am in a place to say like, oh, this is this is me being crazy because of menopause. 
I hope it's not the kind of thing you experience and have like no knowledge that that is what's happening. Cause I don't, my wife might divorce me. I, I completely agree. And I, I'll tell you why my mother claims to have gone into menopause when she turned 50. She says she turned 50 and that happened to be the same year that, that we moved to the United States and she said her period stopped. She went into menopause and that was it. She didn't have any symptoms. She felt great. My mom said fine. the same thing. I beg. <laughs> My mom differ. said the same thing. Mom, she said 50. And I just had a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But other than that, that was it. <laughs> Lies. Lies. I remember having a discussion with my father after having an argument with my mother that was so full of nonsense. It was ridiculous. And we we're about to get into the car in the garage. And I said, Dad, what is going on with her? I don't understand it. Is she going through menopause? And he said, no, I don't think so. And he said, well, what is this? Is she just going to be in a bad mood for the next five years? What is going on? She was blissfully unaware of her menopausal symptoms and how mean and grouchy she was during that time. The rest of us knew exactly what was going on. So, yeah, I think that we can all pray for awareness, right? And that we won't take it out on those that we love. But I also think that we should give ourselves a little bit of grace when we do have moments that, you know, we wish we could control, but we can't. And just understand that, you know, we wouldn't behave that way if we were not so hormonal or menopausal yeah. or perimenopausal and that we just need to, to be a little bit forgiving and understanding. And, and certainly at least for me, the men in our lives need to be a whole lot of understanding. Um, yeah. Cause I, I mean, it, it, it could be asking a lot too. Right. I mean, if I just was like really grouchy and rude to you for like eight years, <laughs> you, you might be like, listen, there's only so much a person can take. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So this is, I'm just, I've invented a new game. So I'm going to say a symptom and you're going to tell me if you think it's a symptom of perimenopause or not. Are you ready? Okay. Ooh, okay. All right. So, okay. Um, anxiety. Definitely perimenopausal and just being yes. alive as a human being. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Age. Okay. Yes. Uh, diarrhea. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure it probably is. It sounds uncomfortable enough to be connected in some <laughs> way, but it's not not a symptom okay. that I've read. Yeah, it is. It is not on the list, but. Again, this okay. list is, I mean, okay. Um, uh, you said one already. Okay, migraines. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely related to the, the hormones that are up and down constantly. Absolutely. Headaches migraines, and migraines. Check. For sure. Okay. Heavy sweating. Uh, definitely. And in the middle of the night. Yep. Yes. Yep. Heavy sweating. Unfortunately. Okay. Not peeing enough. Probably, yes. I I would say that it is. And I think that that may be part of the conversation that I had had with the doctor connected with the, the UTI. So the internet says just that as you get older, you have more dryness and that can lead to more bacteria. This is a yeah. lot of TMI. I apologize, but it leads to more bacteria and that can cause UTIs for people who traditionally don't have. You're right. It says it actually lists um, having to pee often as a symptom. So, you know, I mean, basically most of the things that are going on in your, any, if any hmm. of these things in your happen, it's, it could be perimenopause. So, okay. How about, yeah. Fair so enough. it did say, not, so it did say um, heavy sweating. It also says night sweats. So either, or if you're lucky, you could have both. You could just sweat for 24 hours, you know, just a continuous sweat a thon, if you will. Um, Wait, you're, you're sweating 24 seven and you're peeing a lot? I know. I, how do you keep up? You're going to dehydrate into a little raisin. I don't, <laughs> you can't listen. I can't do it all for all of us, Jessica. You have to take on some of these. I can't just be sweating 24 right. seven. Um, okay. Here's, here's another one. So, um, uh, what else have we got here? Oh, okay. 
um, what is it called? Hives on your neck. Perimenopause or no? I'm going to say no. You're right. Nope. That's just allergies. I tried to trick you. Um, okay. Yeah. What about changes in sexual desire? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely on there. Absolutely. I mean, this, this is like sure. an exhaustive list. Like, I think, I mean, there's 20 things on here that, that could be symptoms. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, how is a person supposed to know? I mean, you get it. It feels very unfair. Yeah, you can get a test though, right? I mean, I have you, it's like a blood test and they look at your like hormone levels and sort of see where you're at. Is that? Yes. Yes. Um, you can absolutely do that. And I would recommend that if your doctor tells you that it's not necessary that you insist. Yeah. Um, because there, there are doctors out there who sort of discount what those blood tests can tell you, but they can be really life-changing in what they tell you because if your hormone levels are off um there is definitely something that you can do about that and that's what we're all looking yeah. for right is is ways to improve our lives now it, it it is interesting to note that depending on when it is that you take those those blood tests your hormones can be affected by what's naturally going on in your cycle and that type of thing so you really need to be working with a doctor who is experienced with reading these tests correctly and understanding them and knowing whether or not they're normal or whether or not you need additional estrogen or, you know, whatever. Well, it does, it does make but, sense. Well, um, we do need to advocate. Yeah, and it, and it makes sense if you think about having insist. all of these things add up to one thing helps because if you're Mm -hmm. looking at all of these things and you're treating them individually so uh you know your joints hurt so you're taking some sort of muscle relaxer and then next thing you know you have trouble sleeping and so maybe you're taking nyquil more than you used to and then you have trouble concentrating so you're freaking out that you have you know early onset dementia so you're doing crossword puzzles all day and you know if you treat all of these things Mm -hmm. individually as they come and go you're going to feel like a hot mess. Whereas if you say like, oh, okay, I recognize that this is just like part of the process and it may come and go, or it may come for a little while and, and then leave. I I think that it probably helps because I can't imagine trying to battle all of these various items as they cycle through. um, Should you, you know, be unlucky enough to get all of them. So. Right. I, this is an, an unsponsored (laughs) plug. But I discovered a supplement a couple of years ago. It's a company called Better Body Co. And they make a supplement called Provitalize. And it is designed for perimenopausal and menopausal women. Helps with bloating. Helps with, um, you know, the the aches and weight gain and um, night sweats and sleeping and all of that type of thing. It's it's a natural supplement. And I have been taking that for quite some time now, like I said, a couple of years. And I found that to make a big difference in my life. So I'm taking one natural supplement that helps me with all of the things. Whereas before I was taking something separate for my migraines. I was taking something separate for sleep and my achy joints and restless leg syndrome. And I was, you know, I was taking all of these separate medications and now found that I can sort of combine a lot of that in one easy to take healthy supplement that has made my life a lot better. So, you know, do your research, find the thing that works for you, but there are, there are things out there that can help you to feel better so that you feel like you're targeting one thing. Instead yeah. Of 20. So, so restless leg, I'm, I just, I'm sorry, I have to go back. Mm-hmm. Tell me, tell me what mm-hmm. that is like. Cause I, I feel like in my mind, it is like when I kick my wife in bed and then tell her I have restless leg, but I say, I think it's funny. Um, but I, that's not <laughs> it. And I think it probably is one of those things that sounds kind of silly, but if you have, if, if it's happening to you, it's miserable, right? What is it like? It is. So it's quite painful. It's the, for me, the inability for me to keep my legs still when I'm resting or trying to go to sleep or when I'm sleeping, I constantly toss and turn 
my legs physically ache and I can't get them into a comfortable position. And it's super frustrating because it keeps you from having a really good night's rest um, or even a good nap. Um, and it's, it, yeah, it's pretty miserable. Yeah. I do feel like I, I do better with restless leg when I'm exercising okay. a lot. And so that it's one of the reasons why I go to the gym at night instead of in the morning is because it does help to calm down my restless leg so that I don't have to be on medication because I, I do have a prescription for a muscle relaxant uh, for that, but I don't want right. to be on it all the time. Yeah. It makes me tired. And, and I don't, I don't want to live on, on medications every day if I can avoid it. So um, there are, there are things that I do to sort of combat it, but yeah, it's not, it's not terribly pleasant. When I was, you just feel like you have to shift your position constantly yeah. um, because it's so uncomfortable. When I was younger, uh, like elementary school, junior high, I think I might've had like restless mouth syndrome. My dad probably would have diagnosed me with that <laughs> He would have because he would have been like, you just, you just stop talking. And I just, I didn't stop talking. So I feel like if restless mouth syndrome is a thing, um, that's my, that's my excuse. You might still have hey it. now, whose show is this? Good Lord. Really th throwing you the zingers. You literally have a show <laughs> that is about talking um, I excuse like me. I just looked it up. Restless mouth syndrome, syndrome is a rare condition that can cause many symptoms Stop. similar to restless leg. People with RMS may experience. Uh, you are lying. No, are but no, none, none of the is none of the really symptoms are talking too much. So <laughs> I don't think that I have it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was in, the the silence you heard was me undiagnosing myself with restless mouth syndrome and also trying to figure out if if I had some other excuse uh, for that. But and just so you know, uh, swelling and numbness in the roof of your mouth, symptoms that spread to the tongue and buccal surfaces. I don't even know what a buccal is, but I love a bugle, which is one of those chips, the corn chips. And did you put yeah, on your yeah, fingers? those that look like the long when I was a kid, the mm -hmm. long nails. Yeah. And um, a strong mm -hmm. urge to move your jaw, which uh, you could interpret as a, as talking. I mean, it's like I can't I have a strong urge to move my jaw and have a sound come out. I don't I it's not my fault. You might have you this. look you <laughs> you might have it. You you don't even look like you're joking. <laughs> you look like you're really considering that I may have. OK, not diagnosing myself with anything anymore. Uh, also, my parents used to say this, and um, I don't recommend saying this to your children, um, although I, my parents said it. And at the time, I wasn't terribly offended. But I feel like if I said it now, I'd be like uncool. <laughs> uncouth is that a word mm -hmm. okay uh yeah. diarrhea of the mouth mm -hmm. that was a that was a common yeah. um occurrence in my house <laughs> uh i don't think I, I the thought of it is grossing me out so i can't i don't want to talk about it anymore because those those two things mouth and diarrhea they should not be in a sentence together yeah good no, together it's not it wasn't. Um, I thank you, by the way, for participating in the um, is it perimenopause or not game? I I've never known. I don't know. Did you I did. pass? You did. did I but the, the test? I think it was like a 70 percent. The problem maybe. is, is that I was trying to think of symptoms that are not perimenopause. And it turns out there are not many. Mm. Like, I mean, we have on right? here mood changes, changes in sexual desire, trouble concentrating, memory trouble, headaches, night sweats, hot flashes, hot flashes, um, you know, female dryness, which you talked about, trouble with sleep, joint mm -hmm. and muscle aches, heavy sweating, peeing often, and PMS-like symptoms. Now you tell me, a symptom off the top of your head that's not What's on that it? list. <laughs> like, I mean, besides cr crusty scabs, well, like that's not on the list. So, <laughs> oh, I mean, the only thing that I can think of is what yeah. you brought up already, which I know the that's the, but I feel like vomiting. Vomiting is not on the list. <laughs> So that's good. Okay. Um, go. And I, I tried to think of some sort of skin related because there was no like, yeah, yeah, like uh, genital warts. That's not one of them. So that's, I mean, okay. I just, 
This I is know. taking I'm sorry. a turn. This is what this I've is got. I'm trying to think of things that it, that if you had them, wouldn't mean you're a perimenopausal. And the list is short, my friends. So <laughs> I'm digging here. Um, I know. Welcome to it. I'm t- but, you know, in some ways... You, you mentioned sort of like knowing, right? It's like just having the knowledge is half of the battle. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I'm going to use this perimenopause as, as an excuse for, for a lot of things in my life for the next eight years, even if it's not legitimate. I feel like it is. So when I get the opportunity, I, I'm going like, to just say it. I feel like it's that's... It's perfectly, perfectly fair. fair. If I have to go through it, Completely then I get fair. to I get to use it. Like I'm sorry that I cursed you out last night. I'm perimenopausal. It's not my fault. That is. Not, I'm sorry that I'm sweating all over the bed. I'm perimenopausal. Oh, mm-hmm. night perimenopause. sweats. Let's talk about that. I've not had them related to perimenopause, but I was sick recently and had them like fever breaking kind of night sweats. Nah. Nope. I don't want that ever again. I don't want to sign up. Zero out of 10 and don't recommend it. Um, so I'm well, when I what happens when I look through these lists of perimenopausal symptoms is I'm like checking off the ones that I could tolerate. Like, OK, yeah, like maybe let's see if I had to pick off this list. Would I take that or would I take that? Like maybe I take having to pee off and that doesn't sound terrible, but I don't want the heavy sweating all day one. That one's pff. I mean, no. if I had to rank them, that's on the bottom of my list and right I'm, there. I am, a, I am scared for the hot flashes. Oh, yeah, the hot flashes. Now, I've read the only last a few minutes, but apparently yeah. it's like really unnerving. Yeah, hot flashes I yeah. take off. This, um, the uh, trouble with sleep one, I also, not a fan. I would take the joint and muscle aches maybe before trouble with sleep because I need to rest to be like a decent human being to people. So if I had Amen. to pick, I, if I had, if I had to pick three of these symptoms, I would pick having to pee often, uh, mood changes, because I feel like, yeah, people have mood changes. Like, that's that's fine. It doesn't say that I'm going to, like, you know, lash out in anger. It just says mood changes. So I'll take, maybe I'll take some of those. And then headaches. I, I feel like headaches are, you know, I mean, they're not great, but I could take a few headaches. But I don't know that I could handle the night sweating and then also the day sweating, <laughs> apparently and then the trouble the trouble sleeping and the not remembering anything i, I don't want any of those i i, I pull my magic eight ball none of them sound particularly I, pleasant i want to like i'm gonna yeah i think you selected the less i tried evil. i mean they're all kind of crappy i want to invent like a magic eight ball that's like just got the symptoms of perimenopause in it you know like you just shake it up and you're like what am i gonna suffer from <laughs> today Looks like hot flashes. Okay, I'm staying home then. It is that it random is. too. You just never know when something is going to hit or what it is and when it will leave. It is quite random like that. So that would be a very good analogy. I, the magic eight ball <laughs> of pyramids. I, I think I taught you something today, though. I don't often get to teach you very many things because you're wiser than me, as we've already discussed. But formication. That was new to you, huh? The word. It, the it word. is new to me. I did not know that it had. Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't know it before. And I'm glad that you have taught it to me because I know that it's something that I absolutely do not yeah. want to this, my life. This show so is full you. of um, science and data, as you can tell. Just very solid facts. Oh, clearly. Um, <laughs> so, well, I... I'm glad that you are willing to talk about this with everybody um, because you're right. I think we don't talk about it a lot. And I know that, like I said, I didn't even know what it was, but now I know and I'm going to use it as an excuse for a lot of my ill behavior over the next 10 years. And then the 10 years after that, I get to use menopause. So I'm I think I'm I'm going to it's going to be smooth sailing for me if I can pull this off if i can get through it and still be like married and my children don't hate me i do think that is one good thing about having kids younger is that maybe you go through menopause when you're not raising your children because you said your mom went through menopause when she was still raising you whereas for you you're going to go through it and my is already an adult and so i that is kind of a what one of the benefits of having kids younger is that maybe you don't have to go through menopause and be a parent because i think that could be tough oh of course yeah, there's there's no way. And and it's very important 
that when I do go through menopause, that Maya is not living in <laughs> yeah, my house. I mean, the- <laughs> because the two of us would murder one another. Somebody would pass The away. only thing uh, harder than and- parenting is parenting and heavy sweating at the same time. So I think that's I feel like that's a great place to end parenting and sweating. It's hard. It's hard. Parenting's hard. Sweating's hard. But doing both. That's that's a feat. So um, thank you for chatting with us today and sharing some of your very wise insight. And I hope that menopause flies by for you. Like just. Thank you. I wish Just that like for a, me too. What do they call it? A thief in the night? No, I think sure. that's a phrase. Okay, thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm sorry that I said phrases that don't make sense. Um, like a thief in the night. This is our flashbacks. We're out. Want more? We're on all the major podcasting platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. Just search for Hot Flashbacks and subscribe.